civilizations, we need to have a dialogue between civilizations. So 2016, we established the Socrates-Confucius dialogue. A couple of years ago, when I spoke to Jeffrey Sachs, he asked me why Socrates? It should be Aristotle. So five years later, we will do the Aristotle and Confucius dialogue. So Confucius, aka Ban Ki-moon, and Aristotle, aka Jeff Sachs, please join Roger Cohen, who will facilitate this dialogue and prevent us from this clash of civilization. Welcome, everybody, to the Democracy Forum, 10th edition. Long enough looking at those images that we saw to see that a few years have passed. Um, I am very happy to see you all here. And rather remarkably, I'm joined tonight by Aristotle on my left and Confucius on my right. Uh, I'm not sure what Socrates feels about his replacement by you, Aristotle. Maybe you'll tell us. But in any event, it's a great pleasure to have you both here on the stage. Uh, we're meeting at a difficult moment. Um, there's a war in Europe, nuclear weapons, the use of them is being threatened. Our societies seem to have a great deal of difficulty determining what the truth is. Some people speak of post-truth societies. Inflation is rising, soaring. Food and energy prices are rising rapidly. And there's a great deal of disillusionment in our societies. I'd like to turn first to you, Aristotle. What is to be done about these problems? What should we do to try to make a better world? Thank you very much for uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity. I can tell you it's very easy for me to uh, take this position because for 10 years, I had the incredible honor to be special advisor to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and I always felt that I was advising Confucius. Uh, I really always felt that I was advising an extraordinarily wise man who understood the core of Confucius's approach, which was relationship because the Secretary General would always explain to me if I'm meeting my Chinese counterpart or my American counterpart or my counterpart from Germany, what are the special implications and feelings? What are the proper rights in order to honor the counterparts? And by honoring those counterparts, he accomplished remarkable things, the Secretary General. In fact, bringing us the two most important agreements of modern times, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. And those are agreements that reached 193 member countries. To do that, you need the wisdom of Confucius. So what does Aristotle bring to this? You why, are, may I remind you, you are Aristotle. And, and why uh, do you, uh, I sit as Aristotle and I suggested not as Socrates? Socrates, of course, was declared by the oracle at Delphi as the wisest person in the world. He had great doubts about that, so he spent his life asking people about what is a good life. They could never give a coherent answer, so he finally realized Maybe I am the wisest person because I know I don't know the answers to these questions. And that was his conclusion. But my sense is that his philosophical grandchild from er Socrates to Plato and Plato to Aristotle did know important answers. Aristotle gave us 
the two greatest books on this topic of human well-being ever written in the Western tradition. And they come together as a volume. The first is the Nicomachean Ethics, about personal behavior. And it is paired with the politics, which is the invention of political science, but not Machiavelli's political science. Aristotle's political science is politics for the good, for the human good, politics based on ethics. Now, Aristotle told us something of enduring value, 2,300 years of enduring value. But I think in the modern age, the first thing Aristotle would have done is to pick up the phone or send a WhatsApp to Confucius and say, could you come over to the Athens Forum? We need to talk. And here it, you are, here be, you are. Because it seems to me like our theories, while they're phrased differently, are really similar because both of our theories put the essence of a good society in virtue. It's the virtue of the leaders. It's the virtue of the citizens. This is the core of Aristotle's political thought and Confucius's political thought. We lost it in the year 1514 when Machiavelli told us, no, it's not virtue, it's how tricky you can be. And then politics became managing power, not cultivating virtue and well-being. And I believe that we need Aristotle and Confucius back again as our real guides, not the study of power, but the management of human well-being based on virtue. Because we've lost even the concept of this, ladies and gentlemen, of what is a virtuous life. And before we hear from Confucius, I want to say my favorite part about Confucius, because it also exemplifies Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He said, if we can come to appreciate and understand courtesy and music better, there will be no more war. And I want to put underscoring on courtesy because it's not even a concept. In my country, no courtesy. We have the right to do this. We do what we want. Nancy Pelosi, we fly to Taiwan because we can do that. No courtesy. If there's no courtesy, there can be no peace. There will only be war. So Confucius has it exactly right. We need courtesy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aristotle. Uh, Confucius, if I may turn to you. And please remember, you are Confucius. When you say I, you are speaking as Confucius. Confucius, in an age where everybody can shout publicly through social media, and there's so much noise, and as Aristotle just said, um, a loss of a sense of politeness, respect, courtesy, um, is it too much to ask that your virtues, uh, the virtues you believe in, be respected? First of all, it's a great honor to participate in this uh, 10th uh, Athens Democracy Forum for the first time. But last May, I participated in the regional forum in Seoul. So this is my second time. And thank you, Madam President, for your presence. Now, thank you, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, for your very kind words about me. In fact, uh, he was my special advisor, but I was his uh, you know, st student, in, in fact, when it comes to logics and teachings. I hope that Confucius will not be angry about me if I misinterpret what he had taught us. As, an, as a nation and Korean student from the very young age, we have been taught what Confucius and Lao Tzu, Sun Tzu, and many other Asian great thinkers and scholars have been teaching us. So I've been really trying to use that kind of wisdom 
during my time as Secretary General. United Nations is composed of many tens of thousands of people who come from different, different backgrounds. Now here, what I'm going to tell you about the theme of this Athens Democracy Forum. The Why Democracy Forum at this time organized by New York Times and why we are here. Because the most of the countries are going through very difficult times because of the lack of leadership of our leaders, either elected or kings or whatever positions that they may have. I have met the hundreds of um, world leaders, president, prime minister, and ministers. But what I have found during my time, unfortunately, and this is exactly why I'm here, I found that there is some, something missing in their leadership quality. What is that missing? That's a global vision and global citizenship. Among so many world leaders, current and past, it was uh, very hard to find genuinely global leader with the global citizenship. That's why you, may, you should know that the first thing I did after my retirement was to establish a Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens in Vienna, where one of the United Nations headquarters is located. I really wanted to train and educate the succeeding generations with some global citizenship. Then what does global citizenship mean? If anybody is with global citizenship, then I don't think we are now suffering from all these political conflicts and poverty and human rights abuses. That is what I'm going to say. Now then, what did Confucius said to us? He said, as a leadership quality, the governance of one's governor, I mean, governing, governing uh, rule is followed by the families, governing governance of the family. Then it's followed by the governance of the state. Then if um, this means, for example, if you behave well with integrity in your family, then you will be able to govern the country. Then if you can govern the country peacefully, then you can achieve the world in peace. This is what, what uh, Confucius taught us. I really wanted to follow uh, his uh, teachings. Confucius, then, may, Confucius, may I ask you a direct question, Confucius? Yeah. Remember, you are Confucius. Uh, what might President Putin learn from reading you? President Putin? Yes. If he I read you, him, you, you wrote these, all these extraordinary things. I, I, um, I, met him, I met him many times during my time, but I was uh, deeply, deeply disappointed by what he had done against the Ukrainian people. His illegal aggression of Ukraine should be condemned as strongest possible terms. As a member of the elders, uh, the private organization founded by Nelson Mandela, composed of um, former heads of state and government and Nobel laureate, I'm working as a vice chairman of these elders, and we condemned his um, aggression, and we even urged the international community to establish a special tribunal, criminal tribunal, to make accountability on him. I visited uh, Ukraine on August 16 with uh, former president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, who is a Nobel laureate. Nobel laureate. I was uh, deeply, deeply concerned, and it was a horrendous atrocities, atrocities which were committed by 
Russian soldiers. Then, at that time, I was also very much uh, disappointed by the silence by many countries around the world, except a few, except uh, America, Europeans, and some countries in Asia, like uh, Japan and South Korea. The most of the countries, all the countries in Africa, Latin America, Middle East, I think they've been keeping silence. I, I spoke out. In this case of aggression, then silence is not an option. Neutrality is not an option. The famous, very respected Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, he once said, if you keep silence in the face of injustice, that means you are joining the side of oppressor. This is what I'm going to tell you. Thank you. Aristotle, if I may turn to you, um, you've, you've journeyed through time and uh, done extraordinary things um, to get here. You have in your writings uh, the idea of the, the golden mean, the idea that balance um, is essential to life, um, uh, moderation. Um, Aristotle, do you, as you look around uh, the world, do you feel that we've, we've lost that sense of balance, that we just hurtle helter-skelter from one thing to another and have lost this concept that can be an orienting compass in life? I think that the uh, war and the geopolitical crisis between the US and China is a reflection also of the loss of balance but not only in the way that it is commonly understood. I, Aristotle, I guess, uh, yes. was a, I happened to be advisor to President Gorbachev, uh, and That's to- That's extraordinary. It how, is. How, how, did you, how did you do that? Were you on a, because when some you were, kind of hotline from somewhere? Because when you are the world's somewhere. greatest philosopher, you can okay. do all sorts of things. Uh, and, and the advisor to President Yeltsin, and the advisor to President Kuchma. Uh, in the first years uh, of uh, Ukrainian independence. So I saw one crucial thing, which was that at the end of the Cold War, the United States and Germany promised to the Soviet Union and to Russia, if you disband the Warsaw Pact, we will not extend NATO. You actually witnessed this, Aristotle? I, you are saying that you witnessed this? I absolutely... It's disputed by former Secretary James Baker, you yeah. name it. It is... You, you saw, you heard that, you were in the room? If, if, anybody, uh, if anybody would like to write to Aristotle's email address, sachs at columbia.edu, I will send you to the archival files that show explicitly how Hans Dietrich Genscher said explicitly, we will not move an inch east, and also how the Secretary General of NATO in the NATO meeting in 1990 said, we will not move east at all. So Aristotle, are you blaming the current crisis on the West breaking its promises? I am blaming the current crisis on the lack of balance and moderation, absolutely because the idea that this is only one side is a myth. This is a crisis that has been brewing for 30 years, and every year Russia said, please do not come closer to our borders. Please do not come closer to our borders. Please do not come closer to our borders. That's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. So you and think- in it, And in 2008, it, it, nonetheless, do you interrupt Aristotle? Well, Please. sometimes I'm obliged to. I'm, I know you've come a long way. You must be tired, but I, I feel it's. Uh, I feel I have to from time okay, to time. Please. <laughs> no, Aristotle. So the, these broken promises, they were. Uh, they would not have been broken if the leaders had been wise enough to consult you. Is that what you're saying? We had very wise statesmen. Statesmen who followed. Confucian and Aristotelian thought. You think, like, you think like, that you really think they're one and the same? Like George Kennan, 
who said in 1997, NATO expansion will lead to the next Cold War. He said it immediately. And we entered a region of crisis. And being Aristotle, I called the White House last year and I said, please stop the NATO enlargement because maybe we can still have peace. But they're not philosophers, they're people of action. Uh, and they were not interested in stopping any expansion. They declared three times in 2021 that Ukraine will be a member of NATO. We trapped Ukraine in the middle of this battle between these two giants. It's an utter tragedy for Ukraine, an utter tragedy. Because if you have Aristotelian prudence, what the Greeks call phronesis, wisdom, contextual wisdom, if you have temperance, moderation, sophrosyne in Greek, if but you Aristotle, have the sense of justice, diokin, dio, dio, uh, oh, excuse my Greek, diokizomi, uh, what is it? Diokizomi, yes. If you have these virtues, you know, don't push the other side. Don't fly to Taiwan because we have the right to do so. Exercise prudence, moderation, sense of justice, respect for the other side, and then you won't have war. This is what Confucius meant when he said, if you come to understand and appreciate courtesy, we will not have war. Courtesy, please, courtesy. So Aristotle, are you in despair? Aristotle, have you despaired this century? We, uh, we're not yet a quarter of the way through the century, but Aristotle, you seem to be writing us off because we've lost touch with the most fundamental values that we need for a peaceful world. That's a very pessimistic message from such a brilliant man. Aristotle was not a no, pessimist. No, you, you are Aristotle. I am not a pessimist. Because what I teach is that human beings have two sides. They have the sides of selfishness and they have the sides of virtue. But the goal is to cultivate virtue. Arete in Greek, excellence, personal excellence, political excellence. And what we teach as philosophers is not that human beings are intrinsically good or intrinsically evil, but they are teachable. That virtue can be cultivated exactly what my colleague Confucius says, that people can learn virtues. Now I also know, and I'll just say, things, it's every generation's responsibility to keep working for virtue because it's never a done deal. And the greatest philosophers, my teacher Plato, was attempted three times to be an advisor to the governor of Syracuse. He failed all three times. It's hard to be a foreign advisor, by the way. They don't listen to you, even to my teacher Plato. But it doesn't mean you can be pessimistic. It means we have to redouble our efforts at our own virtue. Because by cultivating our own virtue, we cultivate the response in others as well. That's the idea of courtesy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aristotle. Confucius. Um, <laughs> Confucius. Um, Given what you said previously, I imagine that hearing from your distinguished fellow philosopher, Aristotle, that the West is partially, somewhat, maybe largely, to blame for the war in Ukraine, that seems to be quite a long way from what you were saying. So, Confucius, what do you feel about that? First of all, what this uh, conflict among the countries and between the countries, uh, I'm 
deeply, deeply worried and angry that even in this 21st century, now countries are trying to occupy by force, by force a certain territory. This is totally unacceptable. At the same time, I am deeply concerned about the weakening of multilateralism. If multilateralism has been supported and strengthened, the if the United Nations systems, particularly Security Council, has been really uh, up to the commitment in the chart of the United Nations, I think we, we should not uh, unne unnecessarily suffer from all this, particularly people uh, from you know, Ukraine. Therefore, as I'm, as a former Secretary General, I'm very sorry that the United Nations has not been able to discharge its charter, provision charter duty. There should be some loud and clear from the international community that they should uh, reform the Security Council. During my time, there's a lot of such discussions, and even the French government has offered voluntarily that they would be willing to uh, refrain from exercising veto power when it comes to purely humanitarian issues, like in the case of Syria, when a lot of people were suffering from this. And then most of the member, you know, veto power, they rejected this one. That's where we stop. Therefore, we should not repeat what we had been repeatedly making failures. This is what uh, I'm urging again. We have to meet, meet the demands of the international community. There are many people who are suffering from hunger, abject poverty. There are many people who are, whose human rights are abused by big powers and uh, some people with the powers. This is something which we cannot uh, you know, Thank accept at this time. Thank you, Confucius. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine that I mean, Aristotle was talking about how top secret he's been advising Western leaders about various things. I imagine you, uh, as Confucius, that you've probably been advising Xi Jinping also about what he should do. Uh, what have you been telling uh, Xi Jinping about the possibility of uh, an invasion of Taiwan, for example. I imagine that you've been urging him to show restraint. Uh, I'm deeply uh, disappointed by what uh, uh, Chinese and particularly India and some other countries have taken uh, positions. Uh, the Lao Tzu, another great uh, Chinese uh, scholar, who lived almost at the same time with uh, Confucius. Even he was born 20 years even before Confucius. Many people know about Confucius, but not much, know, not much people know about Lao Tzu. He said in his uh, teaching that the, the way the heaven is to uh, or help the way to heaven is uh, now let me see the way of heaven is to be beneficial to all all the things and the way of sage is serving the people without competition without competing this means when it comes to some disagreement then you have to really um, uh, compromise with other people. Professor Sachs mentioned about the China and U.S. relationship. At this time, without United States and China working together, it will be almost impossible to address all global challenges, not to mention climate change, but also all these uh, global security issues. And therefore, what I'm urging both leaders 
Of course, the significant difference in political systems, ideologies, and the way they are doing. But I think at this time, when you really want to address all these global challenges, we have to join all our hands on the deck together. Both US and China must work together. Otherwise, it will be only the people, it will be only the countries who will suffer. There are some, some scholars have suggested that uh, I think they, um, their relationship, if they change the course of their work, I think we can make some progress. Thank you. I can say there may be three capital C's, cooperation, competition, conflict. But they began with a conflict. When you begin with a conflict, then nothing can happen. Let them cooperate. Thank Let you very much. Let them compete Confucius. in transparent manner. Then in the course of this competition and cooperation, there will be a way of mutually understanding better. This is what Asian way of thinking can help resolve all these problems. Thank you so much, Confucius. A final word from, from you, Aristotle, and it needs to be to quick. I'm sorry, I know it's been a big effort to get here, but uh, when you look at East-West relations, um, are, you, are you worried that your universal ideas uh, are only understood in, in part of the world? Do you think there is a fundamental uh, issue in East-West understanding? I, I literally think that the fact that the core of Aristotelian virtues and Confucian virtues are so similar is the core basis for hope. There is a common humanity that can cooperate together, can work together, can build virtue together. There is zero intrinsic reason for conflict between the US and China. The problem is actually a little bit of uh, US neurotic reaction to China's rise. China is viewed as a threat. It should not be viewed as a threat. China should be viewed as a normal country trying to have a normal life in this planet. It just happens to have a lot of people in it. And that makes it big. But the idea that it is some threat that must be combated is an unvirtuous idea. Because China and the United States and the West can cooperate with each other, and we have to cooperate with each other. But Aristotle, you see no difference between American democracy and the Chinese surveillance state? I think it's absolutely important to understand something about my philosophy, and please reread the politics. It's I will, I will, it's, I it's promise. A, it's a wonderful book, and it says something. There are three basic forms of government, by the one, by the few, and by the many, but they each have a good side and they each have a bad side. The good side of the one is monarchy. The bad side of the one is tyranny. The good side of the few is aristocracy. The bad side of the few is oligarchy. The good side of the many is republic. The bad side is, uh, is uh, he called it democracy, by the way. Uh, but just uh, so you know, uh, it, it is uh, mob rule. So. We shouldn't You're think, saying the United and, States today is, and, and is a state of mob rule? Did I understand you correctly? I, we have mob rule in the United States to a large extent. You should be very clear. We had a mob attack our capital led by the President of the United States. That's mob rule. That's pure populism. That worried Aristotle a lot when he wrote in 330 BC that we would have populists like Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, or many others. But the attempt at mob them. rule was repulsed. And what? In the end. It, nothing's in the end. That's the whole point. <laughs> Everything is a continuing effort for the good, and we are so far from achieving the good that we need to achieve. We need to do better. But my point is the following. We should not judge simplistically another social system 
even another political system, by simplistic categories. I never did as philosopher. I asked the question, is this for the common good? One thing about China that I would like to emphasize, China went from 80% extreme poverty in 1980 to no extreme poverty 40 years later. It is the most successful economic development in history. It learned a lot from Korea, by the way. It learned a lot from Japan. It learned a lot from the neighbors. It's extraordinarily successful. Life expectancy rose enormously. Education rose enormously. Quality of life rose enormously. Hunger fell completely. This is an accomplishment. We should take joy in China's accomplishment, not fear from it. We should congratulate China for its good works, and we should sit down and understand each other because there is so much common interest but we don't even talk to each other. We point fingers, we say they're on the other side of the divide. We don't want to talk. The first bit of wisdom to go back to Socrates is to talk. Thank and you. that's what we need to do. Thank you very much, Aristotle. Thank you, Confucius. Thank you, Thank you all.